Okay, so we can get started with the second session. And I'll hand the baton to uh, Octavia. Hello, everyone. We are about to start the Cancer and Body MR session. And it is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Simon Cherry, uh, who will be giving a, a talk on the Explorer uh, project, uh, the, first, the world's first total body PET scanner. So Dr. Cherry received his Bachelor of Science uh, with honors in physics and astronomy from University College London, and then completed his PhD in medical physics, also at uh, UCL, at the Institute of Cancer Research. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at UCLA, and then joined the faculty in the Department of uh, Molecular and Medical Pharmacology at UCLA in 1993. In 2001, Dr. Cherry joined UC Davis as a professor in uh, BME, Biomedical Engineering, and established the Center of Molecular and Genomic Imaging. He was the director of the center from 2004 to 2016. He also served as chair uh, of the BME department at UC Davis from 2007 to 2009. He is a, a founding member of the Society of Molecular Imaging, an elected fellow of six professional societies, including IEEE uh, and the Biomedical Engineering Society, or BMES. He is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Physics in Medicine and Biology, and the author of more than 200 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. Um, so he received the Academy of Molecular Imaging Distinguished Basic Scientist Award, the Society of Molecular Imaging Achievement Award, and the IEEE Marie Sklodowska Curie Award. And in 2016, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering uh, and, uh, and the National Academy of Inventors. So his research interests uh, center around biomedical image imaging, in particular the development of in vivo molecular imaging systems such as PET, but not only. Um, also Cherenkov uh, imaging. Uh, and he is one of the co-inventors of the MicroPET technology that is, has been widely adopted in academy, uh, academia and drug development in industry. And he has contributed to, to the development of high performance detectors for PET. So he has also developed the first proof of concept hybrid PET MR system. And uh, now his latest research endeavor is the Explorer project, the theme of today's talk. Well, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me at the back OK? Great. So, um, so what I'd like to do today is actually tell you somewhat the story of this project, which um, like our previous speaker when he was talking about the long path to this uh, high field magnet, we've had a similarly long path um, with this project. So as, it, as this project has involved industry partners, I just do just want to provide you with the disclosures that in the course of this project, we've had relationships both with Siemens Medical Solutions um, and with United Imaging Healthcare. So I want to start out just by reminding us, you know, we do millions of PET scans um, a year in hospitals throughout the world, and, and it's based on an absolutely beautiful piece of physics. And so I think sometimes we forget that. I'd like to, to start the talk uh, today by just reminding ourselves that you know, we're imaging these, these positron-emitting nuclides that emit a positron into tissue, and the positron's an antiparticle. So we're actually indirectly imaging antimatter here. So it it's almost sounds like science fiction, yet we do this in our hospitals every day. And of course, the positron very quickly in tissue will meet up with an electron and will annihilate. And here comes Einstein again. We just heard a lot about him in the first talk. And the conversion of the mass of the positron and the electron into energy is, is uh, characterized, of course, by Einstein's very famous e equals mc squared equation, where the mass of those two particles gets converted to high energy photons um, that are emitted and that we then subsequently detect. And we detect millions of these events to form our reconstructed images. So this is the beautiful piece of physics that is at the heart of everything that we do in PET. So of course, if you look in the, in, in, in the commercial space, we have these really state-of-the-art uh, PET scanners today. Um, the images that we get are almost unrecognizable from 20, 30 years ago. The uh, improvements in the technology have been absolutely stunning. Of course, we've also seen the integration of PET with either CT or MR, so you don't buy a PET scanner alone anymore. We need the anatomic context often to interpret the PET scans. So we have this, this incredible technology. And so it's not uncommon as, as uh, new students enter our program at UC Davis, they're interested in imaging, and they'll come to my office and they'll say, well, you know, I'm interested in imaging, but hasn't everything already been done? You know, the, the, these systems seem very mature. What role is the, 
for me to play. And I hope today, and I think you saw it in the, in the first talk as well, and I hope you'll see it in my talk, you know, there is still, still so much that we can do, so much that is unexplored, so many opportunities, and I think um, the Explorer project that I'll talk about today um, is one of those that hopefully will, will change the way we do PET in the future. So before we talk about the Explorer project, I need to remind you how we usually collect our data in PET. So uh, PET scanners today typically cover 20, 25, maybe at most 30 centimeters axially along the body. And a lot of the um, clinical use of PET is in, in, in oncology, where we're interested in looking at metastatic disease. And so we have to scan a large fraction or all of the body um, to characterize that. And so the way, of course, we do this is we step the patient through the scanner, take a scan at one position, move through to the next position. And over time, we build up whole body images, um, um, such as is shown here. And you know, one of the challenges, of course, is that we don't collect at the same time from the entire body. And that, has, um, that causes some severe limitations for some of the things we might like to do in research. Um, but also, the other thing that's stunningly obvious from this slide is that we do a very poor job of collecting the available signal. The radionuclide inside the body is emitting isotropically in all directions, yet only a fraction of the body is in the field of view at any one time. And even for the part that's in the field of view, we only collect a small fraction of the available signal. And you can actually quite easily show that we collect in a PET scan less than 1% of the available signal. So this is hugely wasteful in terms of the dose that we give to our subjects. And it also means that we have very poor signal to noise in our images in general. You know, nuclear medicine in general um, is, is often you know, called unclear medicine. Um, you know, the images are noisy, and the reason they're noisy is we don't collect enough events. So while we like to boast that PET is a very sensitive molecular imaging tool, which absolutely it is, and it is the most sensitive way um, to, to uh, do a molecular assay uh, deep inside the human body, it's also true that we're extremely limited uh, by our low signal collection and uh, radiation dose, or both of those things. So how can we change that? So we go back to where this story begins, roughly 2005. And there's a somewhat younger version of myself and my colleague and close friend, Ramsey Badawi, on, on the left. Ramsey had recently joined UC Davis. I'd recruited him to our program. And we were sitting in my office one day thinking about you know, what we could do together, what we could work on. And so Ramsey had actually been uh, running some simulations. Um, some computer simulations to figure out what would happen if you increase the length of scanners from 10 centimeters actually, which is what they were at the time, to, whoops, to, uh, to 20, to 30. And he went all the way up to 60 centimeters, which was seen to be outrageous at the time. He was simulating what would happen to things like scatter. People were very concerned as you make the scanner longer, you'd be much more susceptible to scattered radiation. And so he started to characterize what would happen as you started to move in this direction. I was coming at it from a very different direction. We were, we were working um, almost exclusively in small animal imaging at the time, focused on, on preclinical studies, trying to get very high resolution uh, Im imaging in mice. And we were already doing total body imaging. Our, our, our scanners could image the entire body of the, of the mouse at once. And so it was sort of the convergence of these two ideas and, and the fact that we were doing such a bad job collecting our signal in, in clinical PET that made us wonder about the possibility of really developing a PET scanner that would image the entire body. To go, so to go from a geometry that looks like this, which is your pretty standard PET scanner of today, to a truly total body scanner, which would uh, essentially cover the whole volume of the body and be very efficient at collecting the radiation. So the goal of the Explorer project, simply stated, was to build the world's first total body imaging system. And not just for, for PET, but also um, it is the it would be the, the world's first total body imaging system of any kind. You can't do this with ultrasound. You can't currently do this with MRI. You can't do this with CT. I mean, you can collect whole body images, but it's all, always built up over time. So the idea here, and the thing that drove us from a research perspective, is the idea that actually we could measure the kinetics of our radio traces in every single tissue and organ of the body simultaneously so that we could generate time activity curves such as the ones you see on the right there, where we could watch the kinetics of our traces everywhere in the body. So that's the idea, very simple idea. Um, challenge, um, 
is uh, the scale of the system. We're starting to talk about systems that get very complicated here. We're looking at over half a million detectors, many tens of thousands of channels of electronics, all synchronized to win within a few tens of picoseconds of each other for, for time of flight purposes. Um, we've got a lot of material here. We're potentially using a lot of power, and we have to control the temperature on our detectors really well. If we're going to have better counting statistics and better signal to noise, we'd like to have high performance detectors to take advantage of that. And perhaps the most obvious challenge, actually, and a not insignificant one, is the, the massive size of the data sets that a system like this would produce. So we're looking at, uh, at processing in real time on the system 20 million coincidence events across its large volumetric space to timing precisions in the order of a few hundred picoseconds. Um, and so we can easily be generating data at the rate of one and a half gigabytes per second. And we can be looking in a, in a, in a, a busy clinical environment at maybe 10 to 40 terabytes of data storage per day. The other not insignificant challenge as an academic group was that we estimated we would need to raise about $15 million to actually build a prototype um, to actually demonstrate what this technology could do. So the first thing you do when you have an idea and you have no money in this space is you go and do a very uh, sophisticated computer simulation of what this scanner uh, could possibly do. And of course, we have existing scanners that look like this. So we simulated those, made sure the simulations predicted the performance of the scanners that we already have that are out there. And then we extended the simulation to a geometry that looks like this. And this was the work of a PhD student. Worked five years on this very hard, and I'm summarizing his entire thesis in one slide. Um, this is Jonathan Poon's work. Um, and so he predicted what the sensitivity gain would be from this total body geometry for four different situations. So imaging the whole adult body, uh, we get about a, a factor of 40 gain in effective sensitivity. So signal collection goes up by a factor of 40. If we look at a pediatric subject who, who's shorter, so we don't get as much of a gain there, it's going to be about a factor of 20. And if we only care about imaging a single organ, like we only care about imaging the heart or imaging the brain, the gains are, are smaller because, of course, we can get those organs in the field of view of our existing scanners. But we still gain by the larger solid angle coverage of this total body scanner. And so we get a, a gain of about a factor of four to five in signal collection for those organs. So since a lot of clinical PET um, is based on whole body imaging in adults, if we take this factor of 40 prediction here, we can start to make some claims based on those simulations. So if we have 40 times more signal, one thing is we should be able to get images with a signal to noise ratio that's improved by about a factor of 6.5. So the signal to noise in PET goes as the square root of the signal. Um, so if we, if we can get six and a half fold better signal to noise ratio, we're obviously going to have better quality images. We can perhaps detect smaller lesions. We can de perhaps detect lower grade disease where our radio tracer uptake is not so high. And we can possibly do much faster dynamic imaging. Another claim we'll make is that if we can collect 40 times more signal, that buys us more time to watch a radionuclide or radio tracer as it decays due to the half-life. So we should still be able to have acceptable signal five half-lives beyond what we can currently do with a PET scanner, which gives us a, a bigger window, a larger dynamic range over which to look particularly with uh, some of the shorter-lived radionuclides, like carbonyl 11 um, but also for some of the longer-lived radionuclides, like zirconium-89, that has a three-day half-life, where maybe we can now image out to on the order of one month post-injection. And so for, for some areas of research, that would be very interesting. Another way you could use this signal gain is potentially to speed up PET scanning. So you could, uh, instead of taking maybe 20 minutes to take a whole body examination, we could perhaps do it 40 times faster and get a scan in, in as little as 30 seconds. And that's getting close to the point where we could consider doing a single breath hold PET. You know, most people can hold their breath for 15, 20 seconds or so. So we're starting to approach that point where we could actually acquire a scan in a single breath hold. And the other way you could use that signal gain is you could reduce the injected activity by a factor of 40. So in dose sensitive applications, we reckon we can get down to um, a, a, an effective dose for a PET scan, a whole body PET scan, that is roughly equivalent to that you would receive on a transatlantic round trip flight. And not too many people I know worry about radiation dose when they get on a plane. 
So we're getting down to levels which are within everyday experience. And it also means we could do 40 scans in an in individual over time, perhaps to track chronic disease, for the same dose we currently give in a single uh, scan. So those are some of the claims that came out of the simulations. So the other thing we have to do is build our case in terms of applications. So um, I've been um, relating some of the claims to clinical PET, but I think one of the big opportunities here is actually to expand the range of PET initially in research, but hopefully eventually in clinical practice. Obviously, uh, this system will be very well suited for any systemic disease um, or, or systemic therapy because we're looking at the whole body at once. So obviously, we're already using PET a lot in cancer. But there are other paradigms for PET and inflammation and infection as well that we could consider moving into a little more aggressively. Then the cell-based therapies and trafficking and the growing appreciation that many disease processes involve multiple organ systems, the immune system, the microbiome, and we really need to start treating the body as a system rather than looking at individual organs. There's obvious applications in the area of total body pharmacokinetics, so looking at new uh, therapeutics, new drugs, toxicologic research, and obviously in our own field of uh, validating and evaluating new radio traces, new biomarkers. And then lastly, the low dose, we hope, could open up new populations for study. Certainly expanding the range of PET uh, in pediatrics, uh, more frequent use in chronic disease to track um, that uh, trajectory of disease and interventions, and moving back to using PET more often in normal biology. So we used to do a lot of basic PET research uh, to understand physiology and metabolism in normal subjects. And we got away from that, I think, because of concerns about radiation dose. And now I think when we get down to these very low doses, we can reevaluate that and go back to, to studying the normal human being as well. So we have simulations. We have some thoughts about applications. Now we have to try and get the money. So um, we do what all good academics do. We write a grant proposal. We send it in to the NIH. Our first attempt at this was in February 2008, and it did not fare well. So we heard uh, uh, from the previous speaker about being told he was crazy. We had the same thing. Um, and you can tell by the small font on this, size, on this slide that this is going to be a fairly lengthy list. <laughs> so November 2008, we go back in again, same fate. Then we, we decide we're done with NIH. You know, this is, this is, this is too, too crazy for them. So we go to the Keck Foundation thinking that, that perhaps they'll be a little bit more, more receptive. They didn't like it either. Um, then we tried the National Science Foundation. They didn't like it. Um, and then finally, um, our first success was in November 2011. Uh, the National Cancer Institute had a call called their provocative questions call. And one of the provocative questions that you could respond to was to increase the sensitivity of an imaging technique by a factor of 10. Well, that was a perfect match for what we were trying to do. And so we did get some initial funding. It, wasn't, it, it, it was a small level R01, but it allowed us to at least start to develop some of the uh, technology and the concepts and also um, paid for a lot of the computer simulation work that I, I already showed you. Um, there was also an internal competition to form big interdisciplinary groups at UC Davis at the time. We applied for one of those, and we got that as well. And then um, we also were in discussions with Siemens at the time, and they kindly uh, donated to us um, all the components from one of their MCT clinical scanners. And I'll show you what we did with that um, in just a moment. So we were on a roll at this point. Life was great. We were starting to, to really build up to uh, proposals that would actually fund building the prototype. We had a lot more preliminary data now. Um, we still had a lot of skeptics, but a few people in the field were beginning to think that perhaps this might be an OK idea. So now we went back to NIH with much bigger proposals and bolder proposals, and the predictable happened. Um, did not go well. And when I say did not go well, I mean, we weren't even close to getting funded. I mean, the reviewers just ripped into us. I hope none of the reviewers are here in the room. They might be. It's OK. I forgive you. I forgive you. Um, we went back to the Keck Foundation again. Same thing happened. Then, then we gave up with the United States. We said, we're done with the US. So, so, we, moved to, so we moved to the UK, and we put a proposal in um, between the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust. Um, we went through three rounds of written um, uh, proposals, and then they invited us to a, um, 
to a uh, uh, interview for um, to make the final funding decision. So we went there, we presented. The reviewers were in the room with us. It's a very strange process. So you know, you get 30 minutes to present your project, 30 minutes to answer questions. Then they send you out the room. An hour later, they call you back in and they tell you whether you got the money or not. We didn't. <laughs> that was probably the worst. That was the worst night of this entire project because we got. You know, we've been working on this for a year and a half. We've been through these three rounds of written proposals, so we really thought we had a good chance. We, the reviewers were in the room, we knew who they were. They were people that, when we saw the review panel, we thought, great, we're in a good chance here. These are good people, they know Pet well. Did not go well. Anyway, fortunately, in parallel, around the same time, we went back in at NIH again, and that was the big one that hit. So this was a transformative um, R01 from the office of the director. It actually turned out to be the largest one they've ever awarded. Um, and it gave us $15 million, which is exactly what we asked for, to build the first prototype. So that, that was an exciting day, as you can imagine. All right, so and there we are looking much happier at this point. A little grayer, but much happier. All right, so I mentioned that Siemens had uh, donated to us um, the components from one of their, their, their clinical uh, MCT scanners. And so one of the things we were able to do with that as a first step to, to getting some data was we took that scan and we reconfigured it. We halved the diameter and we doubled the axial length. And so you end up with a form factor that, um, that looks something like this. You can see here it's about 43 centimeters across the ring and about 45 centimeters long. So it's starting to get towards the sort of geometry that we have been uh, talking about. And so this was the project of my, my student, Eric Berg. And it turns out that this uh, geometry is actually really good for imaging non-human primates. And we have one of the seven national uh, primate centers at UC Davis. And so we installed the system there. And I'll show you a couple of examples of studies that really started to whet the appetite, I think, for what this technology could do. So this is FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, a standard radio tracer we use all the time in the clinic. So we're looking effectively at glucose metabolism here. And you know, this is sort of your standard you know, FDG image you know, an hour after injection, you know, you've got nice uptake in the, in the brain, in the heart here as well, this, this animal wasn't fasted. And you've got, you've got, you know, this is sort of your typical whole body PET scan, right? But some of the interesting things we did here was we also did some very fast dynamic imaging as we were injecting. And, and we were surprised that even with a one second scan, you know, we were able to actually capture the delivery of the tracer um, as, it, as it was delivered through, through the vessels, through the, through the bloodstream here. And if we integrate the first 30 seconds, you know, you've almost uh, started to get an almost angiographic type uh, image, which sort of thing we've never been able to do with, 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 with a pet before. Even more intriguing was that we actually brought this animal back the next day at, at 18 hours post-injection. So, so Fruin 18 has a two hour half-life. So we're out um, at about nine half-lives here. Nobody has ever seen what the distribution of FDG looks like at 18 hours. And it's actually quite interesting. So um, for example, the big thing you notice is that the brain has cleared. So you know, the FDG is cleared from the brain. You still see some muscle uptake. Um, so th this is the point that we now can watch our radio traces for much longer in time. And I think that's going to lead to some new insights, which will be interesting. So further along that um, theme, we've done a collaborative study with Genentech where they've been interested in looking at how they chelate zirconium-89 which is what we can image, onto antibodies so they can follow these antibodies for a long period of time. So they were studying different chelators and they wanted to go out um, to several weeks post-injection to understand what was happening to the zirconium, whether it was falling off uh, the antibody or not. And so here's a, a single animal. We've done, we've done a large study with a lot of different chelators. Um, uh, uh, but this is one animal repeatedly imaged from a single injection at day zero all the way out one month post-injection. And so we injected about 40 megabecquerels into the animal on day zero. And at day 30, there's only, if we account for the half-life and also there's some excretion um, as well, we're down at only 0 0.04 megabecquerels. So this is a factor of a thousand reduction in the activity in that last scan compared to the first scan. And yet we can still clearly see the biodistribution. So armed with some of this data and armed with $15 million in our pockets, um, we set about um, the next step on the journey, which was to find an industry partner. And the reason it's important as an academic lab for us to do this is really highlighted by the picture on the right. So the picture on the right is a scanner that was built in my lab. It's, it was built for imaging the mouse brain. Works beautifully. But just look at that thing. 
I mean, you've got cables everywhere, they're hand labeled, there's tape holding some of the components together. And you're seriously telling me that this academic lab is going to build this massive total body scanner on its own, and this thing's going to work at the end of the day with all that data that has to be processed? So clearly, we wanted to partner with a company that knows how to make PET scanners. The other piece of this is, if NIH just funds us and we build one prototype of this thing, and that's all that happens, this doesn't help disseminate the technology. So we also wanted to make sure we had a pathway, if we were successful and if there was interest from the community, that others could access it at the, at the end of the project. So we had, a, we had a pretty big list of requirements that we wanted from our industry partner. I and mean, we were pretty bold. We had money in our pocket, so we, they actually talked to us now, which wasn't the case a few years before that. Um, but what we wanted from them is we wanted access to the, the, their technology, because we wanted to use technology that's already out in the field. You don't want to use brand new cutting edge technology in a machine this size. Probably not a good place to start. We wanted access to their expertise, particularly in manufacturing, all the software behind the scanners, and of course mechanical engineering. We had a fixed budget. We had what NIH gave us, nothing more than that. Um, and then we wanted a company that would, would be interested eventually, if we were successful in commercializing and in the US, pursuing FDA approval so it could be used clinically. So we did the tour of all the companies. Um, we had lots of meetings in fancy rooms that we're not usually allowed in as scientists. Um, there's a couple of examples of, of the meetings there, and this was over a period of about a, uh, about a year. Um, and so, um, uh, so we interacted with all the uh, obvious uh, players, and we met with various degrees of, of enthusiasm, and in a couple of cases, unenthusiasm. Um, it, and it was a difficult decision, but at the end of the day, we decided to partner with United Imaging to build the human scanner. And so um, this slide here illustrates the detector technology that's, that's gone into the scanner. So one thing that was attractive about their technology is they use very small crystals, which means we're going to get high spatial resolution, um, which, is, which is really good. It's uh, based on a silicon photomultiplier readout, which is also good because th th those devices have low power consumption. They're very, very stable as well. So, so all of that is good. And um, so then we, we package the crystals into arrays that are read out by the, the silicon photomultipliers. This gets packaged into panels. And here's one of the detector panels with all the associated um, electronics. So the first thing we did with United was actually to build a small scale version um, to test that all the components were working um, together in, in the way that we had anticipated they would. So they built also a, a, what we call our Mini Explorer 2 scanner which um, is, uh, as you can see here, is uh, uh, 32 of these detector panels, 16 per ring. There's also a CT scanner on the back of this now for the anatomic information. Um, here's one of the first phantom images off this device. So just beautiful spatial resolution in this test object. We can easily resolve these 1.6 millimeter structures here. This is a brain phantom. Um, timing resolution is pretty good. Time of flight, 410 picoseconds. Um, and the idea originally was that after we built this, we would rip it apart again and reuse all the components for the human scanner. But our vet school um, saw the data off this system and said, well, that's actually a beautiful size for imaging dogs and cats. So this system actually got installed into our School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis and is now being used for clinical care of companion animals. And so our very first patient, you see in the, in the bore of the scanner uh, there, and these are the images. It actually took two bed positions. We couldn't capture the entire body of this fairly long dog in, in one position, so it actually took two bed positions to do it. But on the right there, you see the PET CT scans. We zoom in on the brain, and in the heart area here, just beautiful definition of, of the structure, showing that we've really achieved that, that pretty high spatial resolution. And so, so this scanner is being uh, used every day now for, for imaging pets. So now we're ready to build the, 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 the big human scanner. So here's an animation of all the components from the individual crystal building up to an array, and then an array going into um, a panel here. And so we, we build the panels like this. And now we're going to put those panels into a single ring. And each ring is about 24 centimeters axially. And now we'll build up eight of those rings to cover the whole body. And then the CT scan is attached. And so th that is the plan.
So now let's look at the actual physical construction. So we started off um, December 2017. The first ring was built. Second uh, ring by January. By February, we were up to five. And incredibly, in just a period of six months, this entire system uh, got assembled and was ready for testing. And as I mentioned, it has you know, uh, over half a million individual detectors in this system. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And so the axial field of view is 195 centimeters. So we can cover most of the human population. There's some, so there's some NBA players that will not be quite captured from head to toe in this system. But for most people, we, we will get the entire body. Um, and there's a really high quality CT on the front of it. It's an 80 row CT with a really low noise detector. So we can do low dose CT as well. And I should also mention, we're measuring 92 billion different lines of response, different directions of, of gamma ray pairs through the patient body. So the first thing you do when you build this thing is, of course, you do phantoms. And as a physicist, we're very used to doing these phantom experiments. We have these little test objects, and we, we fill them with some radio tracer and uh, with a syringe like this. And then when you've got Explorer sitting there in front of you, you realize you're at a different scale. Now the phantoms look like this. And they're incredibly heavy. This is a water-filled cylinder that covers the, the two-meter field of view. We don't usually dress like this to do phantom experiments, by the way. But, um, and then to fill the phantom, you're not using a syringe anymore. You're using a forklift truck to lift up the already mixed solution. Because once it's in the phantom, you can't mix it. So you have to pre-mix it. So everything just gets a lot more difficult and complicated um, at this scale. So here's the first phantom scan. Just a beautiful uniform cylinder. Um, looked very good. And then we also went down to, uh, oops, keeps trying to connect to the network here and is not happy. Um, and, there, and there is a low dose where we let this thing decay for a long time. And um, we're down at 0.18 megabacarels here, very low dose. And we're still getting decent image quality. So again, the resolution's really good. It's a little bit worse than the animal scanner because the ring diameter is bigger. So we have more photon non-collinearity going on. But still, the resolution um, with standard reconstruction, uh, analytic reconstruction, is just below 3 millimeters at the center of the field of view. And if we use more sophisticated iterative reconstructions, it's under 2.5 millimeters. So really good spatial resolution. It does degrade a little bit um, as you open up the acceptance angle. Um, so this is as we change the acceptance angle. So we're, we're introducing uh, more uh, penetration effects um, as we do that. And so the resolution does degrade a little bit in the axial direction, as you can see. But even in the axial direction, this is a phantom in the axial direction again. We're, we're resolving uh, three millimeter structures very easily and close to resolving two millimeter structures. Now, the sensitivity is the key aspect of this system. So on the left is the standard NEMA test that everybody uses to characterize their scanner. It's a 70 centimeter line source. Rather irrelevant for our two meter long scanner, but it is the standard test. And so if you compare our sensitivity, it's almost 200,000 um, uh, counts per second per megabecquerel. And the industry best is somewhere in the range of 10 to 16 or so for this, for this object. We also did an extended two meter long line source to really reflect the, the, the length of our system. And then we get a value of about 150,000 counts per second per megabecquerel. So these are, for pet, these are, if you're not a pet person, these are just unprecedented uh, levels of sensitivity. So now this is what you really want to see, of course, which is let's now go and scan some human beings. So this was the very first uh, scan. So we did um, a small series of normal volunteers um, in Shanghai at the factory under IRB from a local hospital, Zongshan Hospital there. And so this is the very first subject on September 13th, 2018. And so let's come back to the claims we made, because now we're going to try and use our early images to try and at least qualitatively validate some of those claims. So we'd make claims that we'd get much better signal to noise ratio, we'd have increased dynamic range, we could image longer, we could image very quickly, or we could image at low dose. And I'm going to try and show you examples for each of these claims now. So first of all, um, here is the first scan. Um, and so this is a 7.8 millicurie injection. It's a 20 minute scan, about 80 minutes after injection all captured in, in a single bed position. Um, and if we now uh, uh, zoom in on some different areas of the body, these are cross sections through the brain. So this, I think, highlights the spatial resolution of the system really nicely. Um, this I put up because we're very close to actually um, 
we're very close to actually resolving the lumen of the carotid arteries now as they go up to the brain. Um, here we uh, see uh, coronal and sagittal cross sections. And here you'll notice you can see the major vessels really well. So we can see the uptake of FDG in the vessel walls here. So we've got the ascending aorta, you can see really well, the descending aorta. Um, one of the things that we had not seen before in a PET scan is this tiny little dot here, which is the spinal cord. So just the quality of these scans is really, really beautiful. And also you may have noticed some uptake in the, in the knee of the left knee of this subject, and indeed they have an arthritic condition, and that's probably an inflammatory response there. All right, so that's, I, you know, that, that's just sort of giving you a sense of what you know, the image quality uh, can look like, but let's, let me show you why I think we're already seeing signs that the signal-to-noise ratio is quite a bit better. And in this first scan, there was just some interesting features. So we were also lucky to be able to, in, in, in the next bay, take that same uh, subject and put them on a conventional PET-CT scanner. It's still a very good scanner. It's the United uh, 780 PET-CT system. Um, but this is the one where you have to step and shoot to build up the, the images. So, it, so um, uh, we've got roughly matched imaging times here. Um, and um, this is reconstructed at very high spatial resolution. And then this, this right-hand one here is the left-hand scan reconstructed at matched spatial resolution to this one. So the features I want to point out here is so there is, there is an area of focal uptake here that on the Explorer we see very clearly and it is very hard to visualize on either the, uh, the smoother or the higher resolution versions from the conventional scanner. And then if we look in the liver, there's a, an area here that you might call as a hot spot in the liver. But clearly when we have the much better signal to noise ratio on the Explorer, you can see that that was just noise. And the liver here is a beautiful example because you can see how, how just smooth the image intensity is across the liver, just showing how much the signal to noise ratio has improved. So I think these are early indications. This is not quantitative. This is a very qualitative claim at this point, but I think these are early indications that indeed we do have much better signal to noise ratio. Now, what about extending the dynamic range? So we took another subject and we, we scanned them. Um, uh, we scanned them over time and uh, so here is one hour post-injection, um, here is three hours post-injection, here is eight hours post-injection, and here is ten hours post-injection. So we're still getting really nice quality images, you know, five half-lives out. And we know that a lot of uh, cancers continue to accumulate FDG as normal tissue is clear, so it may be that we're going to see much better contrast for lesions at these late imaging times. Now, that's not very compatible with clinical protocols because you should have to keep the subjects around a long time. I realize that, but still, it will allow us to study these kinetics now that we can go out so far in time. Now, what about fast imaging? So here's a, now a one-minute scan. Um, so again, you can see this is collecting the whole body in one minute. On a, on a typical scanner, it's, it's going to take you between 15 to 30 minutes to collect a scan like this. And here we are at just one minute uh, scan acquisition. Um, I'm going to show you a sequence now of a, of, a, of a sagittal section as we reduce the acquisition time from 20 minutes all the way down, 75 seconds, 37 and a half seconds. So um, even 20 seconds is not too bad. So you know, if we look at the image quality at these very short times here, they're very comparable to what we've been seeing on our current uh, clinical scanners that we have at UC Davis. And our physicians, certainly the 37 and a half second image, the physicians would be very happy reading those images. And lastly, we claim we could do low dose imaging. So here we have a patient or a normal volunteer rather that was injected with one tenth of the normal dose of FDG. And so here's a 10 minute scan or a five minute scan and a three-minute scan. Now, this is a fairly light subject. I should point out it's probably more like a large pediatric subject. Um, it's only a 44-kilo subject. So um, nonetheless, you know, we can do a few-minute scans at one-tenth of the dose and still get good quality images. So, so all of this is nice, but all of this so far has just been doing what we already do, perhaps a little better, either a little faster, less dose, better signal to noise. But now I want to show you something that we've never been able to do before. And that's to do total body um, dynamic imaging. And so here what you're going to see, oops, I'll stop it. I should tell you what you're going to see first so you can then uh, focus on watching it, is we're going to inject FDG through a, a vein in the ankle. And you're, we're going to be taking one second snapshots as the FDG goes into the body. So you're going to watch the distribution of the radio tracer. 
as time progresses, we'll go to longer frames because the distribution is not changing so much. And you're going to watch the, the whole evolution of FDG distribution and uptake over, over time. So here goes the injection. The time is at the top, so you can see where we are in time. So you see the lungs beautifully perfused um, early on there, then the arterial phase. At three minutes, you're going to see the kidneys light up and excretion into the bladder occur. It's coming any moment, so keep your eye on the kidneys. There we go, and then you see the bladder fill up. Um, and now as we're getting out to 15, 16 minutes, you're starting to see the more normal distribution of FDG that we see in our clinical scans. And so, so this is something we've never been able to do before. And, and of course, that goes along with, in every voxel of the body, we can get time activity curves. We, and so here we are in, in, in some of the vessels and, and some of the tissues um, showing you how we can now collect these time activity curves from the entire body. So now just isolating a few snapshots of these early frames. So these are one second acquisitions, um, um, sequential, sequential acquisitions as we're injecting. And so you can see the different phases here. You can see um, the, um, the delivery through the lungs, back into the heart, the arterial phase here. Um, and of course, as I said, we can look at the different vessels so we can start to measure time arrival differences for different organs. Those of you that know about quantitative modeling with PET know we need to know the input function. Now we can actually create an input function for every organ in the body because for every organ, the, the blood uh, arrival time and dispersion is slightly different, but now we can characterize that. So this is going to be very powerful, I think, for total body quantitative parametric imaging. And we've done our first uh, attempt at, the, at this, so that the contrast is not great on the slide here, but these are actually quantitative parametric total body images of the influx rate constant Ki for FDG. And so what you're, what you're seeing here is um, the, uh, the maximum intensity projection on, on, the, on the left. You're seeing a coronal section in the middle and transverse sections through the brain and through the heart here. And, and these are fully quantitative. You can actually go, go in and look at the Ki value on a pixel by pixel basis. And so this is, I think, the excitement. We've never been able to do this before. And so now we can do this with different traces. We can do this with drugs. We can look at the effect of drugs on our traces across the entire body. So this is really what, what gets us very excited about some of the applications going forwards. So just a little bit about the current status. So the system uh, did get FDA approved back in December of 2018, um, which was a big milestone. And actually, today is a very big day for us because the scanner is arriving at Oakland Port right now, today. Um, it's in a container, actually in two containers, on a big ship, something like this. And so we should be installing it at UC Davis next week, hopefully starting on Wednesday. Um, and so this is the family of scanners that uh, uh, got produced through, through that uh, NIH funding. So we have two small scale versions, one um, at our primate center, one at our School of Veterinary Medicine, and now we have the, the full-sized human scanner just about to be installed next week. And so I think now we're starting to, to move towards realizing the full potential of PET, you know, imaging better, imaging faster, imaging longer, or imaging more gently. And of course, you can choose. I mean, you have this factor of 40 to play with, and you can choose how you want to use it. And you will use it differently for different kinds of tasks. So of course, a project of this magnitude wouldn't be possible without a huge team of people both working directly on the project and a lot of collaborators as well. So I want to take a moment to thank them, the team at UC Davis. There's a parallel um, arm of this project going on at the University of Pennsylvania under Joel Karp as well. Uh, we've had good collaborations with Genentech. The University of Sydney we're working on with uh, on motion correction. Um, of course, the funding without which we would have not been able to do any of this from NIH. And then great relationships with, with industry, initially with Siemens and now with United Imaging and also our collaborators at Zongshan Hospital in Shanghai who made it possible to do those first human studies. And above here is, is our team at UC Davis. This is the uh, engineering and physics team in molecular imaging at UC Davis on the top. And on the bottom is the team at United Imaging that it took to put this scanner together and build it for us. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. have questions uh, for Dr. Cherry, please approach one of the microphones and introduce yourself before uh, asking the question. Hi, Matt Rosen, MGH. This is really a tour de force 
of engineering, engineering physics of engineering. My question is kind of a mundane one. So you've done all this work, you've had these amazing industrial partners. Um, what happens now? So <laughs> I, I assume United will make these things. I guess my question is really about there's IP, there's IP that was sort of uh, developed in your laboratory, there was something that was developed at United. NIH, of course, is happy to see these things turn into products. Can you say anything about the relationship, say, between the academic side and the commercial side from an IP licensing perspective or any of the, again, very <laughs> mundane question, but for those no. who work in the space of, of devices, it's kind of an interesting thing. You have pushback from your, you know, you know, a lot of this comes back, comes down to relationships in the end. Um, and the relationships here have been extremely good. There's been a lot of mutual trust. So, for example, you know, United embarked on this project, um, you know, when we did not know with absolute certainty that NIH would allow that to happen, would allow us to, um, to go down that pathway. Um, so, um, and then we, there was also trust on our side. You know, we, we didn't know the people at United Imaging very well when we first started. Um, so, uh, on, the, on the, the IP side, it's interesting because um, there really is no IP here. This is a concept that's been around a very long time, actually. People have been proposing this for decades, but nobody's done it until now. Um, frankly, any of the major manufacturers could have used their base technology to do something like this. So we were fairly agnostic as long as it was, we wanted fairly state-of-the-art technology, but not so state-of-the-art that it wasn't tested yet. But other than that, we were pretty agnostic to whose technology. So uh, now, there's going to be a bunch of IP, well, I'm sure there was a bunch of IP generated in building the system and you know doing time alignment across this massive system and some of the corrections and things like that. And certainly on the academic side, you know, we'll be looking at IP around some of the things that we're interested in, in, in as well. And as you saw, we have a joint agreement with United, and they will get first right of refusal on, on IP that's generated. So that's sort of the, the, the bottom line. Um, I don't know if that helps. And the thing, actually, one of the things that shocked me most was how receptive NIH was to this. Um, you know, uh, the political climate is, <laughs> is not great to be going to your NIH program officer and said, by the way, <laughs> We want a Chinese company to build this system. <laughs> um, um, but actually, um, fortunately, you, you know, uh, the grant, although it comes from the office of the directory, it actually goes through NCI. And the program officer there that is responsible is the one that did the academic industry partnerships for N NCI. So he, he's very keen on seeing technology that they pay for become available. And, uh, you know, we had to show we'd done our due diligence and we'd met with multiple companies and we wrote up a report of our visit to all the companies. And then I don't think it was, um, you know, I think it was so clear why we made the decision we did. And they, they've been incredibly supportive. Um, over here, uh, yes. Mikhail. Um, that, that was mind blowing. Um, and um, just wondering, you kind of with off the shelf um, components, you're able to get a 40X uh, improvement um, in sensitivity and, or in signal. Um, if you were to kind of create ideal detectors to take advantage of the, you know, the different angles available and so on, what is the theoretical uh, <laughs> possible improvement? That, that's a really good question. And so probably the, the next place to push is on the time of flight. So you know, we're at about four, just over 400 picoseconds here. And you know, some of you will know that, um, that Siemens now have a, have a commercial system out at uh, somewhere between 200 and 250 picoseconds, which is another big step. So we'd love to see an explorer with that kind of timing resolution. But I think actually we need to leapfrog that because I, I think we're already seeing signs that we can push down below 200, get close to 100 maybe. Um, it's tough. Uh, you're probably going to need some depth of interaction information because the timing depends on depth. So that's another thing you're going to have to build into the detector. But I think it's achievable in the medium term, sort of five, 10 year, maybe five year term. So yeah, we could get the timing down to 100 picoseconds, that's another factor of four improvement over this. So now your factor of 40 is a factor of 160 compared to where we are sort of today. So, um, so I, I think that's the, that's the place to, to really push next. Um, there's some other areas where you can get some minor improvements, but that's the big one, timing. <laughs> I was expecting that question. And it's a really good one. 
So, um, so currently, um, so it's taking us about five to seven minutes to reconstruct a one minute clinical scan, okay? And work is still ongoing to bring these times down. So that's not too bad, but if we do 20 minute scans, um, which have just tons of statistics, then, then yeah, the reconstruction time is going to be um, an issue. The platform we have for reconstructing is scalable. So we have these eight reconstruction nodes in there right now, but we can add more. Um, and one of the things we don't yet know on the clinical side, which is where we're going to be high throughput and lots of data, is we don't know yet how physicians are going to use this. So are they going to choose to get much higher throughput and go to really short scan times? Or are they going to say, we love the better signal to noise ratio. We want, we want these really high quality images and we'll continue to do our scans at maybe 10 minutes. Uh, in length. So that will also impact, I think, how we set up the reconstruction to meet the clinical workflow. So, you know, we don't yet know all the answers. We're, we're at reasonable times here. These are not unreasonable, but there's clearly still some work to do to speed that up. And of course, there's a bunch of people working on this, both at the company, at our place, and other places around the world, trying to speed these reconstructions up. Maybe I'll ask one more question, last one. Yeah. How many injection rooms do you need? Uh, <laughs> De well, it, it depends on my uh, on the answer to my last question, which is how are people going to yeah. use it? If people are going to, uh, if people are actually going to go to let's say one or two minute scans and ten minute slots, so that you're doing six subjects an hour, then you're going to need at least six injection rooms. If they keep it at ten minute scans and we're in twenty minute slots and we're only doing three an hour, then probably three injection rooms I mean, is fine. Not to belabor too much, but I really think there need to be some workflow innovation. Oh, space. yes. Maybe point of care, you inject at home. And <laughs> then, then, then we have to be creative right, and think differently. I mean, to, and, and that's to build injection rooms like this, it doesn't make any sense, especially here well, in Manhattan. So. The, the ultimate embodiment is a conveyor belt, right? where you line people up, you inject them, and they just slowly move towards the scanner and throw it. <laughs> okay, so we'll finish this more. Fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.